Howdy. Welcome back. Um, let me turn this down a little. Is, uh, I, I can't remember what our new teaching schedule is for, the, there's the dead week, is dead week next week, does it start, it's all week long, so last lecture is this coming Thursday? We've like almost survived an entire semester together, it's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes. Learning statistics, don't, don't be a statistic, learn some, something like that. Um, are there questions about anything? Someone had a question about how to find a significance level. Okay, so um, remember, significance levels and and power are both probabilities of the same event. So the significance level of a test. So the significance level of, of, a, of a hypothesis test is a chance that the test rejects the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. So to calculate the significance level, you need to know what the test is and when the test rejects, under what circumstances, for what data would the test reject. And then you find out what's the probability that you would observe such data if the null hypothesis is true. So. Um, this is in the context of a homework problem. You want to remind me which homework problem it is? Rolling a die? Okay, so uh, the homework problem with a die, <clears throat> uh, the null hypothesis is that the die is fair, right? And so when you're computing the significance level, you're going to assume that the die is fair and then ask what's the chance that you would see that thing that would cause you to reject the null hypothesis. So if your test says reject if you see more than five ones in a certain number of rolls of the die, then what you want to find out is what's the chance you would see more than five ones in that many rolls of a fair die, right? Because that's the chance you would reject if the null hypothesis is true. Does, does that make sense? Sort of. <laughs> sort of. Uh, other question? Uh, you, you could, well, okay, so the, um, let's add a few details just so that we can, I can mimic the calculation better. So let's suppose that the story is that you're going to roll the die 10 times and your test says reject the hypothesis that the die is fair if you see more than five ones in 10 rolls of the die. So that means if you see six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 ones in 10 rolls of the die. <laughs> So if we let um, just make the board accessible here. <coughs> Sorry. All right, so if we let x be the number of number of ones in 10 rolls of the die, right? Um, then what we want to do is we want to find the probability that x is greater than 5 in this scenario, right? And in the scenario that we just mentioned, that the die is fair and we're rolling it 10 times independently, what's the probability distribution of x? So 
rolling a one on this die is like drawing a ticket labeled one from a box of numbered tickets where what are the tickets in the box? Well, rolling a die in general is like pulling is like pulling a ticket from a box that has tickets labeled one through six. But if all you care about is how many ones you get, then really the ticket the numbers on the tickets, you have a one corresponding to getting the, the, the uh, rolling a one, and all of the other outcomes don't give you a one. Those are all zeros, right? So it's like pulling a ticket from a box of numbered tickets where there's one ticket labeled one and five tickets labeled zero. And you're pulling with replacement 10 times independently from this box. So what's the probability distribution of that? Yep, so that would be binomial with n equal number of draws, right? 10 and p equal a 6, the fraction of tickets in the box that are labeled 1, right? So you want to find the probability that a binomial random variable that has parameters n equal 10 and p equal to a 6th is greater than 5. So that's the chance, that the, the, the possibilities for being greater than 5 are being equal to 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10. And you could either compute that from scratch, um, or you could, uh, by, by taking the sum, so that would be the sum from, uh, we'll call it um, x equal 6 to 10, of what's the probability that you get exactly x? Ten, choose x ways that it can happen, and you need to get right. Does that make sense? You need to get x tickets labeled one and ten minus x tickets labeled zero, and you want to look at that for getting six ones, getting seven ones, getting eight, nine, or ten ones. Or you could do this from the applet that lets you just sort of highlight the region under the probability histogram of the probability histogram for a binomial probability histogram with n equal 10, p equals a six, and you just highlight the region from this would, the six outcome would start at five and a half, right? This would go from five and a half to ten and a half. Does that make sense? Yeah, you could, you, you, could, uh, you could do the, I mean, you'd probably want a programmable calculator if you were going to try to do the whole thing at once. Otherwise, you'd just be adding together five terms, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <coughs> yep, so long, long sum if it were 50, yeah. Okay, so the power is the probability of exactly the same event but instead of it being calculated under the assumption that the null is true, it's calculated under the assumption that the alternative hypothesis is true. So this is the power, right? The difference between power and significance level is they're, they're both the probability that you reject the null hypothesis the significance level is the probability that you reject the null hypothesis when the null is actually true. And the power is the probability that you reject the null hypothesis when the alternative is actually true. That's the power against that particular alternative. Okay. So if under the alternative hypothesis, the chance of rolling a 1 is 50% instead of 1 sixth, then rolling a 1 in that circumstance would be like pulling a one from a box of, of tickets where there's half of the tickets are labeled one and half are labeled zero. That would still have a binomial distribution. It would still have n equal 10 because you're still drawing 10 times. But instead of p being equal to a six, p would be equal to a half. Right? And so these, these numbers would be a half. Yep. 
Right? So it's, again, the probability that you see six or more tickets labeled one in 10 independent draws with replacement from this box. But it's from this box instead of from a box that has one ticket labeled one and five tickets labeled zero. Right? You're assuming that the alternative is true and finding the probability of exactly the same event. Okay. <clears throat> we good? Okay. Um, all right, we move on to observational studies and experiments and stuff like that. So I'm going to close the door. What's that noise? <laughs> All right, so uh, one of the, one big application of statistics, one of the main uses of statistics is in analyzing experiments, trying to figure out whether some treatment, and treatment is meant in a very general sense, has an effect. So uh, an example of a treatment could be a drug or a surgical procedure. <clears throat> it could be uh, a chemical coating on something. Uh, it, it could be a mode of instruction. So. Um, an example of something we might, that, that might be interesting is, is there any benefit to coming to lecture in person versus watching lecture on webcast? Okay? Does coming in person have an effect on, your, on learning outcomes? Right? <clears throat> yeah, you guys are here because you think so. Uh, okay, so um, suppose that we wanted to figure that out. How could we... What could we do to try to figure out whether coming to class in person produces better learning outcomes than watching a webcast lecture? What, what would you do? So help me. Yeah. OK, so we could track attendance records and look at test scores. So since we have a webcam here, we know who's been here. Uh, actually, you're not looking at the audience so much, but um, uh, okay, we could keep track of who comes to class and see whether the people who come to class more often do better in the class. Okay. Now, if we did that, there's a possibility of something called confounding. Confounding is when one effect shows up at a, as another, that there's sort of two things that could have a similar effect and it's hard to tell them apart on the basis of the data alone. So what other things, what could produce high class attendance and also good test results for the sake of argument? Right? Perhaps if you're a more motivated student, you're more likely to come to class and you're more likely to do better. And that even if you hadn't come to class, you're one of those people who would study harder and would have done well even if you'd watch the webcast instead of coming to class. Does that make sense? So it might not be the webcast versus coming in person that makes the difference. The, the difference in your sort of studiousness could produce both the tendency to come to class and the tendency to do well. Does that make sense? OK. So if we let you decide whether to come to class, then it will be very difficult to tell whether the same things that induce you to come to class induce you to do well in the course, or whether it is the coming to class that induces you to do well in the course. Does that make sense? OK, so what would be the next step? If we wanted to do, how, how could we then set up an experiment that would, the, the technical word is control for, the tendency for more motivated students to come to class and also to do better in class. <laughs> okay, so one thing, okay, so the suggestion is take a random sample of students and say, you guys, you got to come to class. You got to come to class every time. 
so on. And then we take and then we take another random sample of students and say, okay, you guys, you're not allowed here. You know, all you have is the webcast. <clears throat> And then we could also worry about trying to balance how much time they spend studying or something like that. Although if we took a random sample, so let's suppose that we took everybody who wanted to take STAT 21 in a particular semester, and we randomly divided them into two groups. So we would take half of them at random and say, you guys, you, you're, you've been admitted to the lecture version of the class. There's a seat for you here. And then the other guys, Oh, and by the way, we're, not, we're, we're hiding the webcasts. You don't have access to them, okay? Um, I'm not sure whether we need to do that or not, but let's think, we'll think about that in a minute. And then we take the other, the other group and we say, okay, you guys, there's no seat for you here. You're not allowed in the room. However, there's these webcasts available, okay? Now, if we really did divide people at random between those two groups, then there would be a tendency to roughly balance the number of you know, otherwise A students in the two groups. The number of stu students with different levels of study habits would tend to get evened out by the randomization. Okay? We wouldn't be exactly evened out. There's no guarantee that they would be evened out, but they would tend to be evened out. Okay? And we could then, so we, we'd, be, we'd be roughly balancing all kinds of factors that might affect their academic outcome in the class, including what year they are, what their math background is, whether they've had any previous statistics classes, their study habits, um, what time of day they like to, they, they like to study. You know, all of those things would tend to average out across the two groups. Not necessarily, but tend to average out. And so any difference we see in the performance between the two groups, we would have more confidence that that observed difference really has to do with the difference in treatments. That is, the difference between <laughs> getting to see the lecture in person, and watching the webcast. Does, does that make sense? OK. If, if we don't deliberately randomize, if we don't intervene and mix things up to try to balance what's going on between the control group and the treatment group, then any difference we observe between the performance of those groups, we don't know what to attribute it to. OK. Now, even if we do observe a difference, if we've done the randomization and we do observe a difference between the two groups, that difference might not be surprisingly large given the luck of the draw because the randomization will not balance things perfectly. Right? So we, we can still ask the question, how surprising would it be to see this big a difference in the performance of the two groups if the treatment doesn't make any difference at all? Okay? And that would be a hypothesis test. Right? And say, on the assumption that there's really no difference between the learning outcomes of uh, watching a lecture in person, participating in a lecture, maybe even, um, and watching a webcast, then you know, would, the, would the observed difference, in, is, it, is it reasonably attributable to the luck of the draw in who happened to be in which group? Or is there strong evidence that it really does make a difference? Okay. So we've just got the idea of randomized assignment. So we've got the idea of an experiment. Experiment is where the person who's designing things gets to decide who gets the treatment and who doesn't. Okay. So versus an observational study where you just sit back and watch what happens. So in the first thing we talked about where some people come to class, we just notice how often they do. Some people don't come to class, we notice how often they, they, they don't and we look at their scores, but we haven't randomly done any sort of assignment, that's an observational study. You're just sitting back and watching what happens. An experiment, we deliberately randomize things. We, we deliberately assign some people to the treatment group and some people to the control group. We intervene. Okay? Then we talked, we didn't just intervene, we didn't just do an experiment, we talked about a controlled, so we talked about a randomized experiment where we randomly decide who gets the treatment and who gets the control. And then, moreover, all of these things are based on something called the method of comparison, which is we don't just look at people who come to class and their outcome and say, oh, look, they did well on the exam, they learned something. We compare what happened under two different circumstances. We compare the learning outcomes for those who came to class with the learning outcomes for those who watch things on webcast. Okay, so we've got several ideas there, all of which are important for uh, understanding 
whether treatment has an effect, and making inferences about whether treatment has an effect. Method of comparison, compare treatment and control. Experiment, rather than observational studies, you intervene and decide who gets the treatment and who doesn't. And then the way that that assignment were, was done in this case is at random. And that tends to reduce confounding because it tends to mix people, uh, you know, d other characteristics that could affect the outcome tends to mix them evenly across the two groups, the treatment group and the control group. This, this makes sense to everybody? These are all like really important ideas, the fundamental ideas that are going on here. <clears throat> okay. Um, now, in some circumstances, merely knowing that you are in one group rather than the other can affect the outcome. Um, and this is, th th this is related to something called the placebo effect. And I don't remember if we've talked about it yet, but um, clearly you can't have somebody coming to class and not know that they're coming to class. Or if they don't know they're coming to class, they probably don't know what's happening in class either, so it's not helpful, right? Um, and similarly, you, you, know, you know if you're coming to class, you know if you're watching the webcast. If you're talking about a medical treatment, <clears throat> very often when you're working with human subjects, the belief that you are receiving treatment affects the outcome. Right? So if you give somebody uh, a, a sugar pill and they think that it's a pain remedy, they will tend to experience less pain. It will tend to give them relief. That is called the placebo effect. It is the, the belief that you're receiving treatment tends to affect the outcome right, for, for human beings. <clears throat> so sugar does not reduce pain, but the belief that you're getting a pain remedy reduces pain, even if the remedy has no pharmacological action. This is well known, this is well documented, that people get better when they think they're being treated. There are even studies that compare fake treatments against each other to see which fake treatment is more effective. Right? There, there, there was a study a couple of years ago comparing the effectiveness of sugar pills with fake acupuncture, where the fake acupuncture was done with retractable needles. So somebody thinks they're getting poked, but in fact the needle retracts into the handle. Okay, um, and it turned out that fake acupuncture was more effective at relieving pain than a sugar pill. <clears throat> okay, um, <laughs> all right. So the, the placebo effect is is the idea that that you know th the knowledge that you're being treated will tend to produce or the belief that you're being treated will tend to produce a measurable effect in the outcome. So in order to keep the placebo effect from masquerading as a real effect of treatment, you give the control group a placebo if it's possible to do that, so that both groups believe they're being treated, but one is being treated with something that isn't pharmacologically active and the other is being treated with something that, that you're trying to determine whether it's pharmacologically active in the relevant way. So if I want to determine whether a pain remedy works, I don't just take a bunch of people with headaches, give some of them the, 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 the new remedy and some of them nothing, because the ones who are getting the new remedy would tend to do better even if you had given them a sugar pill instead of the new remedy. So if you want to determine whether it's what's in the pill that makes the difference, you give both groups pills. But you give one group a pill that has the new remedy in it, and you give the other group sugar pills. So the difference between them is not whether they're receiving a pill. The difference between them is what's in the pill. Okay? Because if the difference is whether you're getting treatment, then the, no the belief that you're getting treatment will affect the outcome. Okay, does this, this make sense to everybody? All right, now, it becomes very difficult to do placebos, to use placebos in conditions that have a very radical intervention like surgery. So to do a surgical placebo, you know, uh, placebo brain surgery, right? You have to open somebody's skull and then not do anything to their brain, right? And then close them back up. And there are a lot of ethical issues involved in doing something like that, right? Okay, I'm sorry, there was a question, a hand going up? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so typically, well, you, or you, you're sort of saying um, you, you've enrolled in the study yeah. and we are giving you this pill and we want to, you know, just report your level of pain after one hour, after two hours, after, after whatever. So uh, on a scale of one to five, how bad is it, right? Um, and you, you uh, yeah, it, it, question? Yes. I, 
I think with the webcast example, you, you sort of can't hide the fact that you're either in class or you're not in class. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to have a placebo. It's hard to make it blind, right? You sort of, you don't know the, the, the idea. One, um, another way to think about a placebo is in terms of something called blinding. Um, so <clears throat> an experiment is blind if the subject doesn't know whether he or she is in the treatment group or the control group. So giving someone a placebo then makes it blind because they don't know what's in the pill. They could be getting the pill that's active. They could be getting the pill that isn't active. They don't know which group they're in. And so they can't subconsciously or you know, through the real physiology of the placebo effect um, that, that, that the, the knowledge that they're receiving treatment isn't, isn't going to be a difference between the two groups. Both groups believe the same thing. They're, they're blind. In a double-blind experiment, not only do the subjects not know whether they're in the treatment group or the control group, but the person who's collecting the data on them, the person who's making the evaluations, doesn't know whether the subject is in the treatment group or the control group. Now, the, the, the reason for that is, you know, I, here I am, I'm trying to figure out whether, you know, I've just spent five years in a laboratory developing some new method for pain relief, <clears throat> and I am really hoping that this works. And so I, here I am evaluating you know, somebody or other and, and I'm, who I gave the sugar pill to, and I said, you, you feel any better? Yeah, yeah. And I, somebody I gave my new remedy to and said, you feel better? <laughs> you know, it just, it, it's very difficult to, for, you know, for the experimenter not to telegraph what outcome he or she would like to see, right? If, 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 the, if the person who's collecting the data knows which group the subject is in, the subjects are in. So to do a double-blind experiment, the people who are interacting with the subjects directly, not, neither the subjects know whether they're in the treatment or control, nor the people who are interacting directly with the subjects know who's in the treatment group and who's in the control group. Somebody has to know who it is eventually to be able to analyze the data. Right? The statistician behind the scenes or whatever needs to know who's in which group in order to be able to tally the results appropriately and draw the right, you know, and, and, and perform the statistical tests and draw conclusions. But it's best that the people interacting with the subjects don't. D does that make sense to everybody? Okay. All right, so we've got the idea of the method of comparison, right? Comparing what happens with treatment to what happens with control. You can't just treat and say, oh, look, they got better, because they might have gotten better even if they hadn't been treated. Right? So you need a comparison. We, need, we have the idea of intervention to have an experiment rather than simply sitting back and watching what happens. We have the idea of randomization, randomly deciding who gets treatment, who gets control. We have the idea of a placebo or some other method of blinding so that subjects don't know whether they're receiving treatment or not. For human subjects, we also have the idea of double blinding so that the person collecting data on the individuals, the person interacting with the individuals, doesn't know who's in the treatment group and who's in the control group. Okay. All right, all, all of these are important ideas. We, we good so far? OK. Um, let's, all right, so when we're doing comparisons between treatment and control, sometimes we can do what we were talking about with uh, comparing webcast lectures with, uh, with coming to lecture in person. <clears throat> Namely, um, we have some group of people, we randomly decide who goes into which group in one particular time. It's not always possible to do that. Um, sometimes people are, use the method of comparison to compare what's happening now with what happened at some earlier time in history. So that's called using historical controls. So we might be interested in what is the post-operative infection rate um, after a particular kind of surgery when something or other was used to disinfect the operating rooms versus some other thing was used to disinfect the operating rooms? Okay. Now, it could be that some, some hospital used one chemical to disinfect things, and then January 1st, 2010, starts using a different chemical to disinfect things. And we sort of can't randomly say, this patient gets surgery in this room where it's been cleaned with this disinfectant. This patient gets surgery in the same room, but having cleaned that room with a different disinfectant, right? Because policy has changed. They simply, they used to use something, now they use something else, okay? So if we wanted to compare what happens now with what used to happen previously, that's called using historical controls. So there's still a control group. You can still make a comparison, 
but that's not going to allow as strong inferences as having contemporaneous controls and being able to randomize things because there are other differences between people who got surgery five years ago and people who are getting surgery now and even worse if we're talking about people who got surgery 30 years ago and people who are getting surgery now you know all kinds of things have changed in addition to how the operating room was sterilized right or disinfected does, does this make sense okay um, all right, that would be an observational study because I am just looking at what happened then and looking at what happened now. I'm not sort of intervening to decide who gets what. There is <clears throat> another, uh, so some studies, a lot of studies try to look at things like the effect of age on, on some kind of outcome. And uh, there it, it really makes an enormous difference whether you take a slice through a group, a society at one particular time and compare people of different ages versus take a particular group of people and follow them as they age over time. Right? If you take one slice through and compare people of different ages, that's called a cross-sectional study. You're taking a cross-section of the population. If you take a group of people and follow them as they get older, that's called a longitudinal study. You follow them along okay, as, the, as they get older. Now, there's a great example in the book, How to Lie with Statistics. How many of you have bought the book? It, it's, go do it. <laughs> it's great. It's a really great book. OK. So um, the example that, that Huff gives in this book is that uh, now the, the book is old. I think it was published in the 50s originally. Um, if you look at how women walk, uh, at least at the time he wrote the book, there was a tendency for younger women to walk um, more like this with their feet straight and older women to walk with their feet turned out, more like duck walk, okay? <clears throat> and um, there's a variety of hypotheses that you could make for why this happens. That's sort of like, well, after childbirth, you know, your, your hips open up and, you know, the bones change and this changes and so forth and so on and so your feet turn out more, all right? Okay, so <clears throat> one hypothesis is that as women get older, their feet turn out because of some physiological change, all right? Well, it turns out that what is really going on is that there was a time when women were taught to walk that way. They were taught to walk with turnout, right? And so the older women were born at a time when that was how people were, when women were supposed to walk, and the younger women were not taught to walk that way, and so they don't, right? Okay, so the difference, the, a, a difference that has to do with when you were born ends up being confounded with an effect of aging, right? It has nothing to do with how age affects how you walk. It has to do with when did you learn to walk, right? Under what circumstances were you taught? So that's an example of a cross-sectional study leading to confounding. It confounded the effect of age with the effect of somehow when you were taught to walk. <clears throat> All right, um, there's another example in um, the book by Friedman, Pisani, and Purvis called Statistics. It looks at the um, uh, health and nutrition uh, study, Haynes study, which uh, looked at, um, I, don't, I want to get the, uh, the numbers right here. Um, so let me bring it up if I can. OK. Um, Health and Nutrition Examination Study, 1976 to 1980. Uh, looked at a cross-section of Americans age 1 to 74. <clears throat> Among other things, they looked at things like average height versus average age in, in groups of roughly a decade of age. So heights decreased consistently from about age 20 when uh, men were about 5 foot 10 to age 70 when they were about 5 foot 8. And uh, men's weights were lowest in their early 20s, peaked around age 40 to 50, and then decreased after that. Okay? So one hypothesis is that you know, as men age, they get shorter and fatter. Right? Okay. Another hypothesis is that society has changed, nutrition has changed, a bunch of things have changed, and that at maturity, men who were at maturity, say age 25, Men who were then, say, age 60, were shorter than 
men who were then age 25 were. So that, that at their peak height, they were never as tall as the other group, right? Because, because of differences in nutrition and, and so forth and so on, right? Does this, this make sense? So doing this cross-sectional comparison, you tend to confound all kinds of things that are changing with time with the effect of aging. Right? Things show up as if they're an effective age, and really they don't have to do with that. They have to do with other stuff. Okay. This is a good example, so let me just, just bring this out. Um, so, <clears throat> um, this example comes from uh, Wong's book, uh, which is um, Sense and Nonsense of Statistical Inference. So uh, back in, in the late 80s, uh, the New York Times quoted some evaluation of SAT coaching. And they looked at uh, a bunch of entering Harvard freshmen from the fall of 1987. 69% uh, said they'd gotten coaching. 14% they didn't. There were 17% non-response. We would have to worry about the non-response bias here. That's a, an appreciable fraction of non-responders. But looking among the responders, if you look at the scores of those students who weren't coached versus the scores of the students who were coached, those who weren't coached did better, both on the math and on the verbal. Okay. So the conclusion of this on the face of it is coaching hurts. Right? You do better if you're not coached. Right? What's, what's the problem with this? Yeah. The people that were coached were bad to begin with. That's why they need to coach <laughs> Right, OK, exactly. So the, you know, th this is before it was kind of routine to get SAT coaching. Right? P seeking out SAT coaching in the late 80s was, um, was a remedial thing to do. Right? Basically, you wouldn't get coached unless you thought you were in trouble. All right? So the people who would seek coaching, so these people, the question is not what's the difference between these people and these people? It's what's the difference between these people and how these people would have done had they not gotten coaching, right? And you can't conclude that had they not gotten coaching, they would have been these folks. Had they not gotten coaching, they might have been lower still, right? OK. So, um, how, so how could you examine the effect of coaching? You could take someone, you have them take the SAT, you then coach them and have, the, have them take the SAT again. But there's a learning effect associated with the SAT, right? You get better at taking the exam just from taking it more than once. In fact, one of the best ways of studying for it is just to take the test a few times, right? Take practice tests. So you can't undo the experience of having taken the test. Can't wipe their memories clean, right? Or if you do, you'll probably affect their score in other ways. Um, all right, so what are you going to do? How can you, how can you evaluate whether coaching has an effect? Another randomized study, absolutely. OK, so you could take some group, of, some group of students who are interested in taking the SAT, and you could randomly divide them into two groups, a group that gets coached and a group that doesn't. And then you could compare the outcome for those two groups. And if it were large enough group that you started with in the first place and the randomization went right, you ought to be able to balance more or less the abilities, aptitudes, study habits, all these other things across the groups. And what's left over should be mostly the effect of coaching. You could do a hypothesis test to figure out whether the difference in performance between the two groups was surprisingly large if coaching had no effect at all. So if coaching had no effect at all, then there would, you would still expect there to be some difference between the two groups because you've randomized, right? So you're, gonna, you're, you're mixing things up. There's going to be some difference you'll expect from just <coughs> random fluctuations, but you wouldn't expect that difference to be huge. So if the difference is huge compared to what you would expect based on randomization alone, you can conclude that you can reject the hypothesis that coaching doesn't help and conclude that coaching does help, right? Okay, but this suffers from confounding, suffers from confounding, it's an observational study, right? They didn't decide who would get coached or who wouldn't. They just watched what happened. And there's self-selection involved. People decided for themselves, or their parents did, or whoever, whether they were going to be in this group or this group. Okay? And just like if you let people decide whether they're going to come to class or watch the webcast instead, you're going to get some confounding from the self-selection. 
<clears throat> All right. Um, this is another example of confounding, where one kind of effect shows up as another. Um, this example is also from uh, Friedman, Pisani, and Purvis's book. So, uh, in 1973, there were about 8,500, 8,400 men and 4,300 women who applied to grad school here at Berkeley. About 44% of the men were admitted. About 35% of the women were admitted. So somebody's discriminating, right? Because if, assuming that men and women are equally qualified, that seems like a smoking gun, right? Women are being admitted at a lower rate. The administration was very concerned about this. So they set out to figure out, OK, which department is discriminating, right? Who, who do we go, you know, crack the whip over, get them in line, all right? So <clears throat> it turned out that there were six departments that admitted the bulk of all the students. And so we're just going to call these departments A through F. So almost all of the graduate admissions were in these six, six large departments. So if we looked at the admissions rate for these six large departments <laughs> that accounted for, you know, for the bulk of the admissions at all, uh, they account for more, more than a third of the total applicants. Okay, so um, here's department A. It admitted 62% of the men, 82% of the women. So they're not, they're not the culprit, right? Department B, 63% of the men, 68% of the women. They're not the culprit, right? If you look here, OK, they admit a little, a little more men than women. But it's not a huge difference. Here, it's again more women than men. Here, it's more men than women, but it's not a huge difference. Here, it's more women than men, not a huge difference. How do you account for the fact that so many more men than women are admitted overall, right? Where do you point the finger? How do you make sense of this? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let, let, let me. Uh, are you, you're saying that if more men applied than women, then more men ought to be admitted than women. But what this is looking at, of the men who applied, 44% were admitted. Of the women who applied, 35% were admitted. So it's not saying of the people who were admitted, 44% were men, 35% were women. It's saying of the men who applied, 44% were admitted. So it's saying that men are being admitted at a higher rate per, per applicant. OK, yeah. Okay, so the, the, another hypothesis is that the littler departments sort of add up to a problem in the aggregate. That's a, that's a possibility, but that's actually not what's going on here. Um, uh, it's actually, you can actually see from this table why the numbers work out like this. Okay, look at how many, look at where, so this, we were looking just at the percentages, right? 62% admitted, 82% 80, admitted. Okay, where are the women applying? Okay, the, the, here there a lot of them are applying here, right? A lot of them are applying here and here, here. Relatively few are applying here. Where are the men applying? Where their is huge, huge applicant pool here, big there. Smaller there. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> okay, so the men are applying to the departments that have high admission rates. The women are applying to the departments that have low admission rates. Does that make sense? Okay, so even if department by department there's no discrimination, the aggregate effect when you pull it together looks like discrimination. <coughs> Does this, this make sense? OK, so it's not that anybody's discriminating. It's that women are applying to the harder majors. <laughs> ah, just a little delight. OK, <laughs> okay. The, all right, so that's, that's called Simpson's paradox. Simpson's paradox is that what is true for the parts is not necessarily true for the whole. Okay, when you aggregate things, that aggregation can introduce confounding. Here, what's happening is the effect of different rates of application to different departments gets confounded and appears like 
a difference in the rates at which people are being admitted. Okay, so it's sort of the rate of ap applicants turns into an, an apparent difference in the rate of admissions. <clears throat> All right. Um, okay, let's just go over this little summary. I can get back there. Hello. All right, so if you want to determine whether treatment has an effect, <clears throat> one of the things you want to focus on, you want to use the, the method of comparison. You want to compare what happens when people get the treatment to what happens when they don't get the treatment. You can't just look at what happens when they get the treatment and conclude, oh, they got better, the treatment helps. Right? Um, if you want to be able to make that comparison uh, and conclude that the difference in the outcomes really is due to the treatment and not something else, then you need the treatment group and the control group to be as similar to each other as possible, except for the fact that one gets the treatment and one doesn't. Right? One of the best ways to ensure that that happens is to randomly decide who gets treatment and who doesn't, who's in the treatment group and who's in the control group. That tends to mix up the other factors so that what's left over is the effective treatment. <clears throat> um, all right. If you have human subjects, then the knowledge that the belief that you're receiving treatment can affect the outcome. That's called the placebo effect. So in order to prevent a, the placebo effect from showing up as if it were a real effect, you want everybody to believe they're getting treatment. And so you give the people who aren't getting the real treatment a placebo. So that what's left over is the difference between getting the active ingredient and not getting the active ingredient rather than the difference between getting treatment, get, believing that you're getting treatment and getting the active ingredient and not getting the active ingredient and knowing that you're not getting treatment. Right? The sort of, the, you, you remove the not knowing part. <clears throat> All right. Um, if there's some subjective element to s assessing whether, assessing the outcome, like interviewing somebody and figuring out whether they feel better or something or not, it's better if the person who's making that assessment doesn't know whether a particular subject is in the treatment group or the control group. That's the double blinding side. <clears throat> All right. Um, it is not always the case that, uh, well, let me say it the, the other way around. Every once in a while, nature sets up something that is an observational study, but it is an observational study that is really just about as good as an experiment, just about as good as the best possible experiment could be. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that. This is called a natural experiment. Um, there wasn't any deliberate randomization of people, there, but there were sort of accidents of history that produced something that was very much like uh, a randomization. And this has to do with John Snow's uh, determination of how cholera is transmitted. So um, it, it uh, so Snow was a 19th century uh, physician in London. Um, in the time that Snow was active, this was long before the germ theory of disease was generally accepted. Um, in fact, one of the competing theories was miasma, bad air, that somehow disease was communicated because somehow you were, you, okay, um, the, the air was bad. So Snow was able to show that cholera is caused by some kind of infectious organism, and that that organism lives in water. Um, and he, there were a lot of different aspects to his argument. Um, we're going to look at one particular thing, but one, one, of, one of them, uh, so it looked, there, was, there was a time lag between infection and symptoms. So that time lag, how do you interpret that in terms of the germ theory of disease? That time lag has to do with how long it takes the organism to reproduce in your body until there's enough copies of it that it really makes you have symptoms, right? Um, the the uh, propagation of the disease along trade routes that basically it sort of followed people as people, you know, as, as ships traveled, ship, ship, ship might be in one port where the disease is common, come to another port where it isn't common, and sometime after it's arrived there, all of a sudden the disease breaks out. Okay, so it's been communicated along the trade route by, by, by people. <clears throat> um, in the, in the 1848 uh, London cholera epidemic, he was able to identify sort of the index case and the second case. The first person to come down with it was a seaman who'd just come from Germany. And the second person to come down with it was the person who slept in his bed. 
right? <clears throat> so that's fairly compelling evidence that something is being communicated. Um, so Snow noticed that there were apartment buildings in London where a lot of people had died right next to apartment buildings where almost nobody had died. And he was able to figure out that, I mean, at, at the time in London, there were a bunch of different suppliers of drinking water. And he was able to figure out that generally the, the places where a lot of people died got their water from one of a few water suppliers. And the places where people didn't got their water from a different water supplier that took its water further upstream. Okay, before the others, they were taking water out of, out of the Thames. <clears throat> and um, the, the, the water sort of being taken out of this river that flows through a, a big city that dumps its sewage into the river, right? And so people are basically drinking sewage that includes excretions from people who are sick. And then they get sick as a result of drinking that water, all right? So there were, there were two, two, one water company was taking its water further upstream, another was using some elaborate filtration system that tended to reduce uh, the, um, uh, the infection rate. So Snow made this map of residences of victims. He spent a lot of shoe leather walking around town and figuring out for each building you know, how many people had died, where their water came from, and so forth. And so he was able to, I'm gonna, gonna read. Um, uh, okay, so that the, uh, w one of the water companies actually moved its water intake, where, where it took its water out of the river further upstream between two epidemics. Um, and so uh, Snow was able to compare what happened in the two. So here's, we'll just read what, what he wrote. Um, Although the facts uh, shown in the table above afford very strong evidence of the powerful influence which the drinking of water containing the sewage of, town, of a town exerts over the spread of cholera when that disease is present, yet the question does not end here. For the intermixing of the water uh, supply of the Southwark and Vaal uh, Company with uh, that of the Lambeth Company over an extensive part of London, admitted to the subject being sifted in such a way as to yield the most incontrovertible proof on one side or the other. In the subdistricts enumerated in the table above as being supplied by both companies, the mixing of the supplies is of the most intimate kind. The pipes of each company go down all the streets and into nearly all the courts and alleys. A few houses are supplied by one company and a few by the other, according to the decision of the owner or occupier at the time when the water companies were in active competition. Okay, so the idea here is you don't pick your water supplier. It was picked decades before when the, when the water companies were competing with each other. And the people who are currently living in those buildings probably have no idea where their water is coming from and no choice about it. Okay? They might have chosen to live in that building once upon a time. They didn't know that in the process they were choosing their water supply. This is sort of a blind, that's the blinding. They don't know where it's, what's happening. <clears throat> All right. Um, okay, so uh, each company supplies both rich and poor. Large and small houses, no difference in either the condition or occupation of the persons receiving the water of the different companies. This is kind of saying the random is, it, it is really like a randomization. You've mixed up all kinds of characteristics of the people, but for where they're getting their water. Okay. <clears throat> um, now it must be evident that if the diminution of cholera in the districts partly supplied with improved water depended on this supply, the houses receiving it would be the houses enjoying the whole of the benefit of the diminutions of the malady. Okay, so you switch the water supply of, you, you switch where one of the water companies takes its water, and you have some district where the, the infection rate of cholera decreased between the two epidemics. If it decreased and it's due to the water, you ought to be able to, you ought to, be able to find that the apartments that had lower infection rates were those apartments that were supplied by the water company that had moved its intake upstream. That makes sense? Okay. <clears throat> so, in fact, that's what happened. <laughs> um, and uh, this was um, <laughs> 300,000 people, both sexes, every age and occupation, every rank and station, so forth and so on. OK. So the, 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 the punchline is, to turn this grand experiment to account, all that was required was to learn the supply of water to each individual house where a fatal attack of cholera might occur. Right? So that meant figuring out what, on foot, going through town and figuring out where each and every one of these apartments got its water. Right, just huge, huge undertaking. Okay. Um, if you look at what happened, <clears throat> um, the, uh, the, the, the deaths per 10,000 people varied enormously between 
uh, where these two, where, where the water, where, where the, according to where the water supply was. Okay, 315 per 10,000 versus, excuse me, 37 per 10,000. <clears throat> okay, um, the general rule, however, is no causation without manipulation. Here, Snow did not manipulate things. He didn't intervene to perform the experiment. He relied on nature to have performed the experiment for him, and it's very compelling, right, because people don't know where the water was coming from. They're mixed across all walks of life, all, all kinds of, of behaviors, incomes, everything. <clears throat> right. But typically the case is that unless you deliberately manipulate one variable, you del deliberately treat some people and treat others differently or don't, not treat them at all, use them as controls, it's very uh, drawing any conclusion that something causes something else is tenuous at best. Very difficult to draw causal conclusions from observational data. Conf confounding is the rule, not the exception. <clears throat> All right. Um, so far, questions? <coughs> right. We're going to talk about another <clears throat> uh, wonderful experiment. Um, how many of you have heard of the amazing Randy, James Randy? He's a, he's a magician who specializes in debunking claims of the paranormal. And behind his debunking is sort of a, a, a keen scientific eye and also some sound statistics. <clears throat> um, there was uh, a study done in Germany in the late 1990s <clears throat> on whether dowsing works. Everybody know what dowsing is? <clears throat> you have like this forked stick. And you know, if you're a dowser, you can use this, the, you know, the vibrations or some kind of something or other from the forked stick to figure out um, where water is or find gold or lo locate various objects or things like that. So it's sort of a paranormal claim. It was fairly generally accepted that dowsing worked in Germany. Um, according to uh, this, this publication, there were, uh, at the time, about 10,000 active dowsers in Germany who were making about $50 million a year in the aggregate, applying their trade. Okay? So that's, that's, you know, that's reasonably big business for somebody with a stick. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, in the, the, right, right around the 8990, there was a test of dowsing performed in Kassel, Germany. <clears throat> um, this was done under the, the German Skeptical Society. And uh, th these are the, the scientists who were involved. Um, it, uh, it, w it was published in, in this uh, journal, Skeptiker. Um, there, there's a translation into English that's available if you want to look at the whole thing. The, the, the study was funded by sort of German public television, which was trying to document that dowsing actually worked. They actually expected the outcome of this experiment to be positive, And they were doing sort of a documentary of, of the test. They were not terribly happy with the result. Um, <clears throat> OK, so uh, the, uh, the, the tests were performed you know, near the headquarters of, of, uh, of uh, the, the television network. James Randi, uh, whom I mentioned, the amazing Randi, provided the prize money. Um, if somebody could successfully demonstrate dowsing. Um, and um, he also helped to design the experiment. Uh, experiment started in 89. There was a press release. They recruited people from all over Europe to come and, and demonstrate their dowsing abilities. They, the first round was to kind of figure out what people claimed they could do and then to design a test of those claimed abilities. So based on what they had claimed to be able to do, two tests were designed. Uh, one was called the water test, the other was called the box test. The water test was designed to figure out whether dowsers could figure out whether water was flowing in a buried pipe. So a reason that you might want to be able to do that is if you're about to start construction, excavating for a foundation of a building, you might want to know if you dig here, are you going to break a water main? Okay, so that's why the dowsers get money to help locate the water mains so that somebody doesn't get hit with a great big bill for having broken one, you know, for instance. All right. <clears throat> so what they did was um, they, they buried some pipes 20 inches deep. And um, here's, a, here's a sketch of what it, what it looked like. 
So there's a source tank of water. There was a, a pipe that went to a valve. The valve could be thrown in one of two directions. Okay, if it was thrown in one direction, the water would flow through this pipe <clears throat> over here to a pump, where it would then get pumped back to the source tank. If it was thrown the other way, it would flow through a pipe that was under the dowser's tent, where the dowsers were, in the, and, and, then, and then back and get pumped back. And the dowsers were supposed to figure out, was the water flowing in the pipe underneath them or not? Okay? And what they would do to figure out which way to throw the valve in each, in each particular time was they had a bag of ping pong balls where some of them were marked one way, some were marked another. They'd stir them up, pull one out. If the ping pong ball was one color, they'd throw the valve to the left. If it was the other color, they'd throw the valve to the right. So they'd randomize the orientation of the valve. Okay? Now, why would you want to have two pipes, one under the dowser's tent and one not? It's the control, right? So you want to make the treatment condition and the control condition as similar as possible, right? When you start rushing water out of the source tank through a valve, it's going to make some noise, right? The ground's going to shake a little bit. You're going to know something is happening. So what we want to do is isolate the difference between water flowing through this pipe and not. To have this, the difference between that treatment, water flowing, and control water not flowing be as similar as possible, but for the water flowing. So the difference is not to have water not flowing at all, but to have water flowing somewhere else. Okay? So that everything else is as closely matched as possible. This makes sense? All right. <clears throat> um, so, um, all right. In the box test, um, each dowser got to pick. Uh, one of six materials, iron, coal, gold, silver, copper, or a magnet. And the, the, this object was placed in an opaque <coughs> plastic box, but there were, I think, five identical, no, ten identical plastic boxes, one of which contained the object that the person claimed to be able to find. And the boxes would be shuffled, and the person was supposed to figure out which of those boxes contained the hidden object. Does that make sense? Um, OK, um, now, what tends to happen when you test people for uh, paranormal abilities is that afterwards, if they don't succeed, they say that, oh, the conditions of the test weren't right. Oh, there were skeptics around that ruined the energy field of all. OK, there, there are like a lot of things that people say afterwards. And so to make sure that they couldn't disavow the test after the fact, they were asked to sign a statement before and after attesting to the fact that the test was fair. You know, I declare I've been given sufficient information. You know, in writing, in pretrial runs, I had the opportunity to adjust the conditions. I'm physically and psychically able to succeed, right, et cetera. And then that it actually happened fairly. The conditions uh, and schedule haven't impeded me, so forth and so on. All right, so what did a dowser have to do to get the money, to win the 10,000 bucks? So, um, in the water trial, there were, each person got 30 trials, and they had to be right 25 times out of 30. Okay? They are right 25 times or more out of 30. We would reject the null hypothesis that dowsing doesn't work and conclude that they have real dowsing ability. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, in the box trial, they would get 10 attempts at picking which of the 10 boxes had the, the object hidden behind it, and they had to get it right eight times or more out of the 10 trials, an 80% success rate. So both of these correspond to roughly an 80% success rate. Okay? All of the dowsers claimed that they could get the right answer 90 to 100% of the time. So we're asking them to succeed less often than they claim to be able to succeed. Does that make sense? All right, so it's fair in, in that sense. <clears throat> All right. Um, 21 of the dowsers said they'd participate. 20 actually showed up. One of them, when he came, said that the environment had too much radiation, so he couldn't work. Um, so there were 19 people who participated in the water test. Um, 14 participated in the box test. One of them, the, the, the same one, <clears throat> anyway, uh, <laughs> so found problems with that, ended up getting 20 trials instead of 10. 
uh, was the test was conducting under slightly different circumstances, but he, he signed the stuff otherwise. Okay, all right, so what were the results? Um, it turned out, so first of all, anything you, you set out to do it, you design your experiment really, really, really carefully, mistakes still happen. So there were four mistakes in how the valve was set. This was determined by looking at the videotape that the that television station was, was making, that basically whatever ball was pulled out of the bag, the valve ended up getting set the opposite way. Okay? So that happened four times. <clears throat> um, all right, the individual dowsers hit between 11 and 20 times out of 30. How often would you expect them to hit if dowsing doesn't work? 50%, right? There's a 50-50 chance. It's like random guessing. OK? All right, so they succeeded a little bit more than 50% of the time. You can ask whether that's noticeably bigger than 50%, but at any rate, it was nowhere near the success rate that was needed to win the 10,000 bucks. <clears throat> um, if you look at, at the, uh, the, the, the successes, you know, one person got 11. There were two people who got 20. Uh, nobody got near 25. All right, um, the box, sorry. Yeah, you don't know where the pipe is in the first place. What, yeah, yeah. It, it, this, this was really, I mean, presumably there's at least some difference in how it sounds as well if it's like literally under your feet versus 30 feet away. But yeah, anyway, so it's, it's a pretty generous test. All right, for the box test, <clears throat> um, uh, there were between zero and two successes. Um, all right, nobody got any, anywhere near eight. <clears throat> OK, um, so the prize wasn't awarded. There, there's, um, you know, we can figure out what the significance level of these tests are on the assumption that dowsing doesn't work. And there's a, a calculation of that, which you might want to look at because it's relevant for the homework that's due today as well, since it's looking at significance level and power. <clears throat> um, all right. Um, Let's see. Um, I am going to end the lecture here with the request that you guys do a class course evaluation. There's about 10 minutes left. Is there somebody who's willing to collect these and take them to the stat department office in 367 Evans when you're done? Um, the office is closed until 1, so you'd have to take it like a little after 1 o'clock. Yes? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So I'm supposed to get out of the room while this happens, and we probably don't need to webcast the, uh, the taking of the, of the survey. So um, thank you very much. Um, be grateful for constructive criticism uh, and kindness, both. Uh, <laughs>